Mr. Downs. Thank you, Mr. Cross. Even though they're actually a rather dazzling array of stars, our panel today really reminds me about the old-fashioned saying of a rose among the thorns. Our only lady, our rose, mm. is Martina Arroyo. Mm. <laughs> She's our rose, even though she did refer to herself once as Madame Butterball when she meant to say Madame Butterfly. <laughs> we still get mail about that, Miss Arroyo. Anyway, our listeners know that Martina Arroyo is among the very top dramatic sopranos in the Verdi Puccini repertory. And next come our thorns, the gentlemen, in alphabetical order, John Alexander. One of the few tenors around who's contributed on his own to the current revival of the bel canto operas, where he matches the dizzy flights of all those uh, wacky prima donnas with their mad scenes. And next in the alphabet, we have our bass, Donald Graham, who often seals Steen's scenes and reviews with his artistry as a singing actor. Performances always seem to take a lift when Mr. Graham's on stage. And last, alphabetically speaking, is Cheryl Milnes, one of the younger top baritone stars in the world of opera. His great big voice and his dramatic involvement in his roles make him a special favorite, too. So we have actually four contrasting voices from bottom to top of the human singing range. And what is a little unusual about these four artists is that their speaking voices really sound like their singing range. Even if we didn't identify them for you, you could tell which is which. And all I have to do is say hello. 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 <laughs> now, hello. 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 <laughs> there was something wrong with that, Martina. Beautiful production. <laughs> now, uh, what do you have to say to this? from Corrine D. Anderson of Lawrence, Kansas. She writes, for me, one of the most enjoyable aspects of each singer's round table is the hearty laughter of the participants. Everybody seems to be having such a good time. And assuming that this is the natural laugh of the singers, I'm intrigued to know how these same singers laugh on stage in their roles, as sometimes a composer writes out the notes of a laugh, and sometimes he simply tells you to laugh, and sometimes the singers throw in a laugh on their own. So Miss Anderson's request is, won't the singers please give us a sample of one of their stage laughs? Well, you have Mr. to actually Roy. be a little bit different because it's very, you know, if you're singing, I'm dear little butterfly, you go, oh! <laughs> it doesn't make sense. <laughs> so you go, oh! well, that sort of laugh. But even worse is when you have to scream because, um, you know, you, you don't want to let out with a blood curling. So you go, oh! <laughs> <laughs> that, that's not going to curdle my blood, Mr. Uh, Mr. Guno Graham. wrote it beautifully in uh, Faust. Yes, how do you do uh, that? Well, Let how you it. do it is, first of all, you have to start up on a high G, which Cheryl would love to sing for you. But with that, you know, I don't know where it is right now, but it's somewhere way up there. And then there's another octave, ha, 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 ha. And then the last, ha, ha, ha. Ah, a wonderful sneer in the voice, Mr. Graham. <laughs> Mr. Mills. Well, a couple of examples uh, where it's indicated to laugh, but there are no notes uh, printed for the laughing. In the credo, Iago's credo and Otello at the end of the aria. Which is, of course, the evil oh, that's kind the of laugh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's after my laugh comes the audience. <laughs> or another kind, which is just interpolated in the barber, for instance, uh, per un barbiere, di qualità, di qualità, to play with the words, a different kind of laugh. A, a little happier than your right. sinister Otello. Well, uh, Mr. Alexander, do you want to do you contribute any laughter in your? Uh, you're a more serious. I'm a more serious singer, yes, but we do. We, I oh. Just, I <laughs> well, it takes care that, of the That seriousness. answers your question, I see. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How about stage entrances? Some of the entrances, and exits too, for that matter, have a tremendous dramatic punch, and they can be as exciting as any action in the entire opera. And Nathaniel Brown of Edmonds, Washington, asks you, what entrances and exits give you your biggest kick? And are there any you worry about, by the way? Uh, some well, would you consider an exit 
uh, an exit from the opera rather than from the stage. If you would consider a death on stage, I can tell you one that is sort of startling, and that is, as Dr. Schoen in, in Lulu, uh, I am shot in the back by Lulu. I did it in Boston once, two years ago, when neither the gun on stage in Lulu's hand nor the backup gun in the wings went off. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah. you have to not only laugh, not in this case, but gasp and go, ooh, uh, ooh, as the bullets are fired on bink, after two, three, five, bang, 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 bang. So I died of apoplexy, I guess. <laughs> I, <laughs> I grabbed my back and uh, fell forward and died. Made a real exit. <laughs> That's an exit, isn't it? It certainly Next is. Next time we use real bullets. Yes, thank you. I knew you'd say that. She hasn't. Too. There's a Charlie similar Gander. story. There's a similar story about uh, the end of the opera in which the baritone was to have killed the tenor, and uh, when he pulled the gun, pulled the trigger, and nothing happened, and in his desperation he threw the gun away. But he had no knife. He had no way in which to kill the tenor, and he had to end the opera somehow. So the tenor had his back to him. And the uh, baritone went over and just gave him a swift kick in the pants. <laughs> <laughs> the tenor fell to the ground, clutching his throat, saying, <laughs> must, must be Balo you're talking about, right? <laughs> Must be Balo. And he was heard, heard to say, it must have been a poisoned boot. <laughs> Well, this, this is a, sort of a side exit entrance in Tosca, uh, first act. Scarpia goes off to uh, investigate the, the small chapel, uh, Atavanti. And I was doing it one time in a smaller theater, and the light that was, one of the lights that was uh, lighting the stage was very low. And I went off to pick up the, the basket and so forth. It came on, and, and the light, edge of the light caught my wig and lifted it up. And it's, it's the cue right before uh, fu grave sbaglio quel colpo di canone. It was a grave sbaglio, all right, because I'm walking on stage pulling my wig back down, hoping that my hair doesn't show. <laughs> I've sung with you when I had to pull my wig back on, too. Hmm. <laughs> oh, no, on stage. Indeed. <laughs> so, Roy, you have some marvelous entrances in, in your... Yes, but as a soprano, you see, it's too serious. You can't get around this way. Only once on a tour in Cleveland, I eat a, the scenery had not been properly attached to the floor, and I went to go on and make a live exit, and the whole thing slid right on. So I slid in as I eat it. Which was pretty nice. Of course, an I think another time on tour uh, with various companies, sometimes the sets aren't as stationary, and relating to the same thing Martina was talking about, there's nothing more embarrassing than to go up to a column that's supposed to be marble, <laughs> and you lean against it or something, and it starts to move off yeah. stage. <laughs> Well, I wish there were time to talk seriously about some of your fabulous entrances. We I'm serious. looking forward, and some of your exits, too. <laughs> we all realize, writes Colonel Daniel Harris, Jr. of Alexandria, Virginia, that you, as fabulously trained and polished artists, face your roles with confidence. But is there, in any of your roles, a phrase so tricky that you automatically worry about it every time you sing the role, and would you be so kind as to demonstrate this uh, tricky phrase for us, Mr. Alexander? I think the one that comes to mind for me is uh, the part of Walter in, in Meistersinger. And in the last act, he must sing nine verses of the prize song. And each time, it's different. And these come, for instance, he sings, Wunder, ob Wunder. And the next time he sings, Vornisch entragend, and then abendlich dämmend, morgendlich leuchtend. And it goes on and on and on. Nine times this comes, and each time it's a little bit different. So you have to really be on top of it, otherwise you're really in trouble. And if you, you miss. depend on your prompter. <laughs> right. He's going to look at you and go, bravo. <laughs> and if you, miss, <laughs> if you miss one of the verses, you don't get the prize, right? right That's right. true. <laughs> Mr. Milne. 
Well, of course, uh, I think the first attitude a singer might have is that they don't want to describe uh, any problems that they might have because every time they do it, the audience will be laying for it. They say, see, I told you, he has trouble there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but one, one spot uh, for me, perhaps, in Eri II, in, in Ballo, uh, O Speranza, at the end, it's written, pianissimo diminuendo, and the portamento down, and the question is, are you in good enough shape, a good enough voice to really start at piano and then diminuendo down? I think diminuendi and everybody's voice are, are a problem, and you have to decide at that instant, do you feel like chancing it? Do you feel like playing it so close to the line to mm. do it piano and diminuendo, or if not so, uh, good shape started a little more forte. Oh, of course, if you didn't hold it so long, it wouldn't be such a problem. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Actually, Verdi's full of those things. I was thinking of... No, the just Cheryl. <laughs> <laughs> then no problem for you, Miss Arroyo. I'm, I'm waiting for Macbeth I'm so next. glad to get the note. I just get off quickly. <laughs> James F. Feely sends you this question from Dalton, Illinois. What, if anything, do you and your co-stars say to each other during curtain calls? Get off, you fat tenor. <laughs> it's my turn. <laughs> the worst problem, as far as I know, is men walking behind females who are wearing long dresses oh, with trains. Yes, we can and see they, that they the think of them, you know, they have them up around their ankles all during the performance. If they have to walk up steps, they gather things throw them over their shoulders, but the minute they walk out for the curtain call, it's forgotten. Twelve yards of tool is dragging behind. How are you supposed to walk out hand in hand Twelve with yards someone, behind. with someone, <laughs> hand in hand, I said, Martin, you got long distance. hands. Keep your distance, that's what the idea of the tool. The, the, this, this, all of this, get off, get off of my, get off of my, you aren't standing on my tree. No, 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 we don't stay, talk like that, we say, please get off your big feet. <laughs> big feet, yes. <laughs> Alexander. I did a performance once uh, where the soprano was a particularly accomplished curtain call taker. Uh, she, mm -hmm. she had Thanks developed this, uh, mm -hmm. she yes. had developed this art marvelously. And so after the performance was over, the baritone went out, had a marvelous uh, applause. I went out to take my applause. And then the soprano went out, and she stayed, and she stayed, and she stayed. And the baritone said to me, if she'd been on the street, they would have towed her away. <laughs> I think that's the ringer. That's the ringer for this afternoon. So now we know what you're saying to each other. <laughs> Once in a while we say, is anybody there? <laughs> When's that, Cheryl? <laughs> when we sing when together. We sing, yeah, well. <laughs> All right, here's a question from Andrew Ross of Peekskill, New York, and it's directed especially to Mr. Alexander, but the other panel members are welcome to join in. Uh, Mr. Alexander, you often sing with leading ladies of florid songs, such as... Sutherland, Horn, Sills, Caballé, and so on, who have audiences of fanatically and devoted fans. Is this experience a simulating, rewarding one, or uh, how does it hit you? Oh, John, he's talking about Mary Sutherland, Lino Horn, <laughs> Sarah Sills, and Cora Caballé, of course. <laughs> well, you know, really, to answer it seriously, I must say that, that each time I appear with these uh, gallant ladies, I find it a, a very rewarding experience. They indeed are great artists, and of course, singing in the same performance with them always offers me wonderful opportunity for singing uh, under the best possible conditions. Competing? Not no, competing, no. That's not but, what you but said you at find the rehearsal, that, uh, John, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> they do have great uh, fan clubs, of course, and uh, great accolades from the audience, and of course, this makes it even more of a challenge for me to, uh, to sing and excel and to uh, do my very best, of course, under these circumstances. I, I couldn't agree more with John because actually we've all been part of, of performances of Norma and Lucia and uh, Daughter of the Regiment. Uh, I think uh, these uh, sort of superstars bring a great deal of excitement to the performance so that there, there is an e electricity in the air when the, well, long before the curtain goes up, you know. I've been Joan's father. Sorry to say, the bass never gets to be a lover. It's always a father or a confessor. <laughs> and I've been, 
I've been Beverly Sills' father, so I've done rather well. I've had a the father rather of all. ample family, you might say. <laughs> Professional father, I think yes. that's right. Yes, yes. Yeah. But it doesn't I pay much, you know that. I'm talking about a mother. No, no. <laughs> How about this one from Mary Harris of Denver, Colorado? If you had your opera debut to do over again, would you choose a different role in a different opera house from the one it was? Or can you tell us about that and tell us why. Mr. Mill. Well, I would say in terms of my Metropolitan debut that I would uh, keep it exactly the same. My debut is Valentin and Faust, which is a good debut role because it's a leading part, but at the same time, it doesn't have the primary responsibility of the opera. And uh, that worked out very well for me. But I think my actual operatic debut was the uh, long involved part of the commissioner in Butterfly, which is like one page worth in, in Santa Fe. And I think I was probably more nervous for that than I was for the Valentine. I rehearsed, I must have gone over it, you know, 15, 20 times before to make sure that at that young age, I, I wasn't going to blow any of the words. Would you choose that again if you had your choice? Well, perhaps at that age, if I, if I was going to make my debut now, I certainly wouldn't. Perhaps if I wanted to might have made you more nervous for the very first one. Mr. Alexander. Yes, I made my debut in Cincinnati at the, sun, the Summer Opera in the zoo. Uh, they're competing with uh, sea lions and peacocks and all the animals that were housed very nearby. And my, my debut role in opera was Faust. I started out as the old man, of course, and uh, that was the beginning of my career. I've gotten younger ever since. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a role to begin in, Mr. Arroyo. Well, I didn't debut in Cincinnati, but I did sing Aida there, and at the end of O Patria Mia, or Hyena went off and <laughs> right afterwards. It was a little bit just long. Are you sure that was a hyena? <laughs> 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 well, I mean, I don't know. But... <laughs> <laughs> you said it. I think maybe it was. I know I made my debut. Mr. Graham. <laughs> Practically in a farmyard uh, when I was a student in Chicago. Uh, the Midwest or Universal Opera Company or something like that uh, did Lucia and I sang Raimondo. And it was at the 8th Street Theater, which at that time housed the WLS Barn Dance on Saturday night. I realize that no one who listens to Met broadcasts ever listened to the Barn Dance, but uh, we had no stage rehearsal. We, we did, were there uh, Saturday afternoon for a Sunday performance with the bales of hay and the hay rack on stage and the little leftovers around. And uh, I didn't know... <laughs> I'm sure some of those places, too. <laughs> I didn't know what... Uh, by who by the band was? I think this was a question that we talked about earlier. I didn't know what the role was, and a colleague helped me enormously. He said, whenever I go out on stage, it was baritone Al Brazis, remember him? Who said, you shouldn't be on stage now, but come along, why not? <laughs> because you'll never get on stage if you're gonna just wait until you should. So I trailed behind him, and when it was loud and high, I raised my hands, and when it was soft and low, I lowered my head, and it was an enormous success. <laughs> He's still doing it. He's still doing it. Up the hands. Well, what else? Well, you, you, you got through that. I would have changed the circumstances, yes. Not you necessarily would, the role. Not necessarily the role. Well, apparently you didn't make any boo-boos, but here's a question from Paula McCarter Collins of Pleasant Point, Maine, when she asks you to confess about uh, that kind of thing. Did you ever make a real boo-boo during a performance which threw the rest of the cast for a while? That's a real... Never. Confession. No. <laughs> 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 Do you feel in a confessing mood, Mr. Alexander? I feel in a confessing mood. Uh, I was doing a performance of Taming is Shrew at uh, New York City Opera. And uh, in the duet between the soprano and myself, we uh, kissed at the front of the stage, and then I took her back to a bench and put her down on the bench, and I got down on one knee. And in the opening night, I did just this, and when I put her down on the bench and I got down on one knee, I looked up and my goatee was hanging from under her chin. <laughs> you know, strangely, I thought, uh, I thought I heard laughter from the audience. I really didn't. Nobody ever knew. <laughs> You know, those are times in opera that, that are just incredible. You, you don't quite know what to do, and it's uh, 
It's very embarrassing. One thing, uh, it didn't happen to me, but it was told to me by uh, one of my former teachers, uh, Andrew White, singing the Elijah at a church uh, with an afternoon rehearsal and a night performance. And everyone arrived and rehearsed except the tenor, and there was a snowstorm, something prevented his arriving on time. And he just got in a half hour before the concert was to start. And what they didn't know was that he had never sung the Elijah before. And there's a beautiful aria, wretched even beginning, and at the end, the other aria. But in the beginning, I mean, in the middle, there's uh, a couple of lines. Art thou Elijah? Art thou he that troubleth Israel? That's all. Well, they didn't know, but he didn't know he was, didn't have a thing written. He had never studied it. He'd missed it. So the concert started and uh, they got to uh, number 10, letter A, Allegro Moderato, and the conductor starts the orchestra. And the tenor is sitting there, his score under his arm, quietly, not, not paying any attention. He assumed he had at least a half hour. And the conductor says, orchestra, back, back to letter A, Allegro Moderato, quick, quick. Trying to get the fellow's attention, he's not paying any attention. He knows he has long type words to sing. They do the whole thing again. There's Andy White is sitting there as the Elijah, and he's looking over. He says, "I thought Elijah, I thought Elijah." Trying to get the guy's attention, the fellow looks back at him, puzzled. He said, "No, I thought you were." <laughs> <laughs> Alexander. <laughs> Just a quick story about a tenor who was doing St. Matthew Passion for the hundredth time, and it came time for him to get up and sing, and of course he didn't look at the music, because he knew it, he had done it so many times, and he got up and he sang, and Jesus, I mean Peter, said... <laughs> I'm sorry to say so, but our time is up for the day because the second act of Donizetti's Elisia d'Amore is almost ready to begin. So thank you very much, Martina Arroyo, John Alexander, Donald Graham, and Cheryl Milnes. This is Edward Downs inviting you to join us next week during the second intermission of Gounod's Faust for a session of Texaco's Opera Quiz. Hey, buonasera, a vostra signora.